This is E2B, Energy to Business, a podcast by Opportune, where we bring you in-house expertise that serves all energy sectors. We examine emerging financial and technology trends and provide a broad perspective on ways to stay ahead, create opportunities, and execute market strategies. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of E2B, Energy to Business, an opportune podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Litwin, the voice of B2B. And folks, thanks so much for joining us on another episode of the show. We appreciate you listening along to some opportune thought leadership. As you're listening to today's conversation, make sure that you're heading to our website, opportune.com. Again, opportune.com. For more information on some of the strategies and technologies we might be talking about today, but also to get some more opportune content, including podcasts, blogs, articles, videos, and more. And you can also subscribe to E2B on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Just look us up, hit that subscribe button, and you'll have a full catalog of previous conversations, as well as notifications when we drop new ones. So on this episode of E2B, we're exploring strategies and applications for cybersecurity, specifically around energy trade and risk management solutions, or ETRMs. Like most industries still maneuvering the effects of broad digital transformations in operational and support structures, much of which has been amplified over the last five, ten years, the energy industry is subject to many cybersecurity risks, much like these other industries. And some could say that managing of critical infrastructure makes energy players and their digital networks either more susceptible or more attractive to bad actors or potential geopolitical threats as well. So today we're maneuvering how robust cybersecurity mechanisms are in the industry today, the types of threats towards software and networks in the energy industry, their impact on energy operations, and more broadly, what actionable steps professionals can take now to mitigate this risk and maximize their software tools. So for insights, we're joined by frequent guest Kent Landrum, Managing Director at Opportune. Kent, great to have you on. How are you doing? Great to be with you again today. Yeah, always a pleasure getting to source your thoughts on these topics. And joining us for the first time, we've also got Dan Cornell. He's CTO at The Denim Group, which is a company that works with organizations in various capacities to mitigate their software risk. Dan Cornell, welcome for the first time. How are you doing today? I'm tip top. Love it. Tip top shape. Thank you so much for joining us, and I'm looking forward to getting your thoughts here for the first time. Dan, since you're new, I actually want to expand on the work that your company does here for a second to start us off. So for some context for our audience, at the Denim Group, you're usually working with organizations who are developing software. Uh, So you're assisting in risk mitigation through testing, through security code reviews, but then also designing security development life cycles. And you're also working with supply chain software risk mitigation, uh, making sure vendors are meeting software safety metrics for their B2B partners. So you really have a a risk mitigation footprint across a lot of different sectors here in the software space. So with that in mind, how is your work manifesting in energy applications today? And are there any common areas of risk mitigation work that you're seeing around energy software that you think are worth highlighting to set the stage for us? Well, a real challenge with the energy sector is that it's just so diverse from you know from a variety of standpoints, but especially from a you know a cybersecurity and an application security standpoint, because you've got you know kind of depending on how you want to slice and dice the industry, you've got the you know, oil and gas drilling and production guys, the you know pipeline refining, oil field services mining, you know and you know renewables chemicals, kind of depending on where you want to want to where you want to draw the lines. And there's also a tremendous diversity in the size of the firms. And every kind of classification has a different set of economics around the business, different threat picture. And, uh, I, you know, it's my perception that a, a, a lot of those segments or for a lot of those demographics, energy firms uh, underinvest in cybersecurity. And so how do we interact? Uh, you know, for the big guys, uh, we help them set up and run their programs. And so, you know, again, we're helping them with threat modeling, uh, you know, to understand the architecture of the system, the you know security threats that are available, helping them roll out and optimize testing programs, uh, remediate vulnerabilities and so on. You know, for the smaller folks, uh, you know, a lot of what we do is is helping them raise awareness uh, and in a lot of ways, helping the security practitioners in their organization raise the profile of cybersecurity 
so that they can go and then get get the budget to, that they need in order to uh, you know take a more programmatic view. That's a real challenge in a lot of the smaller folks is they struggle. They take, have a very tactical view uh, as opposed to a more programmatic view, and so we you know, work with them trying to help them uh, you know, make that justification. You know, although we are seeing an increased uh, awareness of cybersecurity risk and especially of application security risk, uh, and especially you know with solar winds. Uh, you know, with the you know, recent exchange stuff, uh, we're also seeing an increased interest in, from these firms in the the security of the software supply chain. So, you know, every you know some organizations develop software. A lot of organizations do, but every organization consumes software. Uh, we're starting to see organizations become more aware of the risk that they're you know, placed in because of the software that they procure. Uh, and so, that's an area that we're you know, helping out in an increased way. Perfect. Thank you for that context, Dan. And now, jumping off of that, it's time to really dig deep here on cybersecurity risks, who the actors are, how they're impacting the energy industry, and most importantly, what are some strategies for maneuvering them and being proactive. So let's get into it. I want to start by understanding the threat environment, sort of en masse. Can you both break down the various nodes that make up the cybersecurity threat environment? in the energy industry and how much weight do cybersecurity risks hold in the industry today? Is this a common pressing issue? A lot of firms in the space, uh, especially historically, have a very guns, guards, and gates view of security. Uh, there's a lot of focus on the physical aspects of security, and that makes sense because so much of what energy does is so tangible. I've got a, a buddy of mine, a former business partner, uh, who for a time was working in an investment firm based out of Houston. He called, you know, called me up one day and said, I figured out why it's so hard to get people to invest in tech in Houston. And you know he had gone, you know, I think, to the Ship Channel and seen an investment that his firm had, where they had a a, a boat that was floating an offshore rig like out to sea to go and drill oil. And uh, you know, and he came to the realization: if you have the ability to invest in something so tangible, why would you be interested in in trying to invest in the in the next Facebook? And and I think that translates where a lot of the industry is focused on the tangible, obviously valuable physical assets that they have to protect. Uh, and again, these assets are often deployed to parts of the world subject to unrest where those physical threats are, uh, are, are, are very serious. And, and the firms are offer, often fragmented. You know, they're you know, multinational, they're geographically distributed, uh, and that creates risks for them. You know, on penetration tests before, we've been able to take advantage of that by bypassing kind of centralized, stronger methods and you know, targeting the local HR operations, local logistic functions, and things of that nature. And so I think that for cybersecurity for application and software security risk, uh, there's a historical bias that doesn't necessarily uh, focus sufficiently on that, um, you know, outside of, uh, again, some of the largest, some of the largest firms in the space. Yeah, and I would add on to what Dan was saying there that we have seen a bit of a promising trend in the last few years where a number of large energy companies, particularly on the power side of things, have driven to combine their physical and cybersecurity capabilities. And I think that has made and demystified to a certain extent the cybersecurity part and made it more of a peer to the physical security that Dan was talking about, gotten it more attention at the board and the executive level. And I think we'll, we'll bear some fruit down the line. You kind of mentioned this to start already, but the energy industry and its softwares are so varied that I'm sure the threats themselves also vary both in magnitude and also strategies for combating them. So can you get more specific there in how the various cyber threats do vary across the energy uh, ecosystem and how does this impact the strategies to plan for and react to threats? Does it make it more difficult? Right, and so the really big folks in the space, uh, you know, extremely large, tend to be tend to be really good. You know, they've got some of the more or most sophisticated programs that we've seen in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, the next level down that tends to to fall off a lot more quickly, and, and a lot of the small firms that we've interacted with, it's it's a it's a real disaster. You know, and uh, you know, so all of these organizations are subject to kind of the you know, standard internet background noise. Um, you know, small guys have challenges with ransomware. You know, that's not industry specific. That's just a challenge with smaller firms that have less sophisticated programs. Uh, you know, what we do see though is, you know, there's certainly some interest from the chaos actors, the hacktivists uh, in the space. 
Uh, you know, they don't really have the resources in a lot of cases to be uh, terribly impactful. The criminal element, organized crime, or criminal element for the financial stuff, especially folks who are on the retail side of the business. Um, uh, you know, the real challenges come in with the nation states, the other geo- geopolitical actors. Those are the ones that are really scary. Uh, you know, oil, energy, power is a huge concern uh, for many nation states. You know, that drives policy. It drives you know the way that they interact uh, as geopolitical actors. And these folks also have tremendous access to resources. Um, you know, and again, what we see with just because of the geography, um, you know, a lot of energy firms are, uh, you know, intertwined with the local governments. Uh, you know, that creates kind of an additional nexus for attack. Um, and these you know, nation state or geopolitical actors have tremendous resources in long time frames. And so that is a, uh, you know, that's, that, that, that's what makes them particularly scary uh, when you look at the energy space uh, in particular. We also need to get a better understanding of who the bad actors are here. So can you give us an assessment of the field? Who is actually targeting energy industry, digital tools and networks? Are they chaos actors? Are hacks geopolitically motivated? Are they coming from hacktivists making a statement against the industry? There's so many options today that I'm sure it's a little bit of everything, but let us know what is most impactful, who are they, and how is this shaping mitigation strategies? And the the scariest stuff that we've seen recently has really been those nation state actors, um, again, because they've got the resources, because they have uh, diplomatic aims uh, or, or, you know, aims that they're achieving uh, via you know, non-diplomatic means, uh, those are the folks that are really causing the most trouble that we're seeing. Uh, and again, you see, um, you know, and, and we'll talk, I'm sure, at some point about uh, the Saudi Aramco um, incident from a number of years back. Uh, you know, that's attributed to state actors. You know, so those are really the folks that we see at the scariest end of the spectrum, you know, that are the ones that uh, drive you know, certain certain behaviors that we're uh, that we're seeing change in the energy sector, and then if you could uh, intersect that around the mitigation strategies, uh, does the fact that you know, the uh, the most impactful hacks or action that you've seen is coming from organizations or individuals with a lot of digital resources uh, and capital resources too, if we're being honest? Uh, how does that impact the mitigation strategies then? Does it make it more difficult in any way? If so, how? Break that down. Well, it, it makes it, uh, I don't want to say infinitely difficult, but it makes it <laughs> exceptionally difficult. Sure. And, and and that's why you really have to take a more uh, a programmatic view where, you're, where you understand what is our attack surface, what is our exposure, and where are the assets that we have that are potentially valuable to those uh, to those actors? And how are we going to both protect those assets uh, as well as have monitoring and remediation uh, to identify potential bad situations and be able to react to those? And that's, a, again, a real challenge we see with the smaller folks where they just don't have the resources or, or maybe they do have the resources, but they don't have the will at the current time to take that more programmatic approach. Uh, when you're dealing with sophisticated actors, you, you can't protect one thing because they have the resources to go after many things or to monitor many things until they find an entry point that's going to be uh, attractive. And so, again, like taking a, a programmatic view, understanding from attack surface, uh, understanding from an architecture standpoint, understanding what layers you have, uh, and then building in not just, you know, obviously building the systems in a secure way, but also having that monitoring and that response capability uh, so that you can react when inevitably you, you, uh, you know, get in bad situations. And to add on to what Dan's saying, I think a couple of good examples would help inform what those risks are, how they apply to energy companies of different scale, and the trends that would tell us where these risks are evolving to and how companies need to be positioning themselves going forward. So I think it's probably worth taking a quick look at the Saudi Aramco hack that Dan mentioned a moment ago. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about the Ukraine power grid incident that happened a few years ago. Definitely. Let's go ahead and jump into those examples here. I think grounding some of the major, I guess, hacks and 
catastrophes around taking advantage of lack of cybersecurity in the energy industry will help us better understand how to then make some actionable steps moving forward. So you mentioned the Aramco breach. Uh, Let's start with that one. Give us the timeline and then who the bad actors were and uh, what impact it had on energy infrastructure and operations. And so the Saudi Aramco breach, I mean, they're the largest oil producer in the world uh, at the time of the attack, August 15th, I think, 2012. They're the most valuable company in the world. So not a not a not a minor player, <laughs> and they had around thirty thousand workstations affected by the uh, Shamoon uh, virus or malware. You know, this malware goes and infects the master boot record, uh, you know, deletes files, and uh, you know causes other trouble. And uh, you know, my impression from seeing the reaction to this is this really impacted their view, and, and this is translated out to other firms in the industry, but it really impacted their view of how dependent they were on computers and digital assets. And that's only become more so uh, the group that did this called themselves the cutting sort of justice claim responsibility. And uh, I think the the general consensus, Richard Clark and others, is this is a a part of Iran's uh, retaliation for the US involvement in the Stuxnet attacks. And so, uh, you know, again, if uh, what I've seen, you know, and people talk about cyber Pearl Harbor. I don't know if that's a, a, a super useful metaphor, but if you do want to look at an event, at least from my perception of security in the energy space, um, that was a, a bit of a watershed moment where a lot of the firms really started to come to an understanding of their exposure from their from the cyber exposure. Again, I, I feel like everybody for a long time has had a very good understanding of their uh, physical exposure. This was a real game changer from the perspective of, you know, as digital firms, you know, what, you know, what do we need to worry about from a risk management standpoint? What do we need to be worrying about? And uh, especially when you look at you know these digital transformation initiatives that these firms are pushing so hard you know that you know only increases that exposure you also mentioned the uh, major breach uh, out of ukraine that i think has a lot of crossover from you know both the business network side to the operations side of um, the energy industry and its infrastructures. So can you break down that breach? Uh, what made it unique uh, you know, in a negative way, obviously, the impact it had and some learning lessons now moving forward? Sure. I, I think one of the big things, Dan pointed out how important the Aramco hack was as kind of a wake-up call for the industry. Uh, the reason I highlight the Ukraine example is it's one of the first cases where we saw the progression from kind of the enterprise or or the corporate side of IT over into operations technology. So that that notorious Saudi Aramco cybersecurity example is a great example of that highlights the vulnerabilities on the enterprise and corporate IT front, but doesn't really get into the operations technology side. And energy companies typically have some significant operations technology or OT footprints that relate directly to the physical assets like the power plants, the refineries, pipelines, substations, terminals, et cetera. And probably the most memorable of this type of breach is the, for me anyway, is the Ukraine power grid event. In that incident, 30 power substations were taken offline and it put 230,000 people in the dark for hours. In this instance, it was a very well-coordinated series of actions that included spear phishing, malware, harvesting credentials that eventually enabled the hackers to move from the OT network, from the corporate network, and attack the SCADA system and use that SCADA system to essentially turn off breakers in those substations and shut down the power. The trend of IT and OT convergence, while it creates a lot of value by providing efficiencies across the energy industry, it also changes the risk profile for this type of scenario. And so it's increasingly likely that an application security weakness on the IT side of the house can be leveraged to attack on the OT side of the house or vice versa. And that means that we need to raise the bar from an application security uh, perspective, whether it's in custom built or commercial software packages like the ETRM systems that you were mentioning before, Daniel. Have those learning lessons uh, been applicable to all players in the energy industry? Uh, Do you think that the industry has matured from these high profile breaches across the board? Because these are obviously very, like I said, high profile um, Aramco being like the most valuable company on the face of the planet when they got hit. 
that's big and their mitigation strategies might look a little different than a smaller player in the space. So do the learning lessons apply across the board and how have both small and large players matured after uh, these high profile breaches? In a, a trick, one of the things I mentioned kind of at the beginning was how diverse the energy sector is. And they also, in addition to, I think that being true, I think they all perceive that. And so I think there has, I've, I've perceived a, a bit of a lack of willingness to learn lessons from uh, adjacent sectors. Uh, when I've talked to different folks, you know, the perception is like, oh, well, you know, they're a major, we're a you know, oil field services firm, it's totally different. And, and it's, you know, that, that, that's fair. You know, there are, uh, you know, there, there are certainly differences in the risk picture. Uh, you know, broadly, I do think that folks in the industry have recognized that security needs to involve uh, a much more serious cyber component than it did before. As I mentioned, a lot of the organizations uh, historically have been, you know, almost exclusively or, or, or largely focused on gun guards and gates, physical security. Uh, you know, I do think that events like the Aramco breach, the Ukraine breach, uh, you know, as well as ongoing breaches dealing with operational technologies and other issues, uh, have have helped alter the risk lens that energy firms view the world through, uh, and so that is a good thing. Certain organizations have taken up the call and have really increased their level of maturity, um, you know, kind of across the board from a from a computer security standpoint. Uh, but you know, I don't feel like the smaller players. Uh, and again, there's I think a pretty quick drop off. I don't think the smaller players have really internalize that message to the degree that is going to be required to help tamp down uh, or mitigate the impact of these incremental breaches that we're seeing. Like you've both broken down for us, there are a lot of aspects to cybersecurity in an energy context. Uh, but today, we're wanting to focus a little bit more on the application space, so software and digital tools in practice in particular. So uh, let's get a general overview here before we dig in a little deeper. How are various best or worst practices, if we're being honest, in the application space uh, creating more cybersecurity challenges today? Give us sort of a lay of the land of how people usually deal with their application space and how that can create opportunities for hacks. Broadly across industries, the and this is a little bit of a marketing buzzword, but it's, I think, instructive is this uh, concept of digital transformation. Right? Organizations are saying we need to you know, adopt digital technologies. We need to be able to innovate faster. We need to work more effectively with our trading partners in order to provide better outcomes for our stakeholders. Otherwise, you know, we have not just a cybersecurity risk, but an existential risk, right? Like no one wants to be the last CEO of Kodak, uh, you know, trying to sell a uh, you know, actual film to folks, right? Like that's a, you know, at, at the sea level, you know, cyber risk is certainly important, but the risk of, uh, of, you know, existence, continued existence is, uh, uh, is, is even more important. And so the response from a lot of organizations is say, okay, well, you know, what is what goes into this digital transformation? We're going to adopt a DevOps culture where we break down the barriers between our development teams uh, doing this innovation and the operations teams that are you know, you know, taking these applications and, and running them out. We need to break down the silos between these folks. Great. Sounds like a great idea. It's, it's really a, more of a cultural change than anything, but then that has implications from a from an architecture from a tooling standpoint so that is technology implications where you see organizations say we used to have all these monolithic applications that would do you know one big thing we're going to break those up into microservices that we can combine in different ways so that we can be more agile and move more quickly you know from a tooling standpoint we need to be able to deliver software faster so we're going to adopt these continuous integration continuous uh, delivery pipelines or CI/CD pipelines, right? And we're also going to start adopting these cloud technologies so that we can be flexible in where we put workloads and we can build applications out of different building blocks. That's awesome, right? And 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 because it helps these organizations to meet these goals, right? They're able to innovate more quickly. They're able to do stuff that they couldn't do before, largely to the benefit of their stakeholders. The challenge here is that these mandates, again, you know, typically come in, in some shape or form from the sea level, uh, like they're going to happen. And the security team is not necessarily included in that decision process. <laughs> uh, actually, I would, say, I would say they're never included in the decision process. They, however, are uh, involved in the implications of that uh, process or the outgrowth of that process. And you know, the standard security team responsible, like, no, you can't do that, you know, 
simply isn't going to work. You know, executives that attempt that you know, end up getting marginalized. And so the challenge that they face is these firms are moving a lot of workloads to the cloud, again, building applications with new architectures, with new building blocks. They're very focused on how do we like how do we just get this done? How do we del- deliver software in this way at the pace that we're being asked to? And there's they don't it's a competency they're building, and a competency those teams certainly don't have is the background to secure those systems. And so it really puts security in a situation where they have to instead of being a roadblock or you know, the department of no, that's not a tenable position. They have to find out ways to be enablers, right? <clears throat> and so they have to essentially as, as risk consultants to the teams that are adopting these new technologies where they're saying, uh, you know, it's like improv, right? You, you don't say no, but you say yes, and. And so when somebody says, hey, we're moving all of this to Amazon XYZ, the answer is like, yes, and you know, we have these templates that we can provide you uh, that show you how to do uh, you know, authentication, authorization management between these different components. Um, and that is really where like the challenge comes out of these uh, you know, newer or less known technologies being used, less familiar architecture uh, being used. That, that's the challenge. The opportunity for security teams is, again, to rebrand themselves as a risk advisor and to uh, proactively involve themselves in this process as, as an enabler. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of an example firm that we were working with where uh, as an oil field services firm, uh, we helped them with some threat modeling for a system that was collecting a bunch of real-time data from you know, geographic, uh, geographically distributed sensors. Uh, you know, they were pulling it into a cloud environment and, and, and storing it in the cloud, which is a sensible thing to do, uh, but they were essentially storing it with the level of security that you would apply to uh, cat pictures that you wanted to share with your family as opposed to more enterprise uh, grade orientation of that. Uh, But again, through that threat modeling process, uh, we were able to work with them and to work with their development teams to identify like, hey, you're doing, we we understand what you're trying to do. Here's how to do that in a more appropriate and in a more secure manner. And so again, that's kind of on the one side how new challenges get opened up, but I really see it for forward-looking executives and, and ones that kind of understand where the cyber risk sits in the spectrum. You know, folks that understand that, it's a great opportunity to opportunity to involve themselves in a way and at a level that they haven't in the past. Yeah, I think Dan spoke very eloquently about the state and importance of development standards, practices, culture, and the like, especially in an environment where we are pressing more into the cloud and digital transformation is a, is a key theme. One of the things that I see repeatedly with energy firms is many of them have a legacy. They are running outdated versions of commercially available applications, particularly for their ERP, uh, their ETRM systems. And since the application versions are older and it's expensive to go through the upgrade process for those, uh, they tend to only be compatible with dated versions of operating systems, databases, development frameworks, and things like that. And the consequence of that is that it essentially traps the IT department. It prevents them from being able to upgrade and patch those components to close known security vulnerabilities. So you've got this tension that gets created because the organization wants to move forward and do all the things that Dan described, but is almost dragging an anchor of this legacy, this this technical debt that they have. And that problem gets exacerbated by the fact that these types of systems are often highly customized. Uh, They're often very much integrated with other applications on the business network and sometimes even over onto the operational systems and the OT side. And the risk is that one of these systems winds up being a soft spot that can be exploited by a malicious actor. And it's hard for IT departments, application security groups to garner the attention that they need when you're trying to sell the idea of we need to do maintenance on this old system instead of spending money on some of the things that Dan identified that are more attractive, the digital transformation, the things that are going to keep you a going concern going forward. And so I see that tension play out uh, repeatedly with clients that I work with. I want to dig in even deeper here into some facets of the application space that are warranting a closer security inspection. So if we break down the applications themselves, for example, uh, ETRM systems, we see various areas that create opportunities for cyber threats like you all graciously broke down for us. Uh, The first being the types of softwares that the energy industry is developing and the roles that those softwares are filling. 
If you had to give us an elevator pitch summary on what is unique about energy industry softwares, what would that be? And how is that leading to cybersecurity threats? So I think Kent made a great point talking about the ERP systems uh, because you know we've seen a lot of energy firms you know view the ERP system as kind of the center of their uh, software universe and they rely tremendously on these ERP systems uh, and, and also think that the ERP system handles everything to, to encompass security. Uh, you know they often don't necessarily realize hey our ERP system can have ch- security challenges with it. Uh, the we, we've done a tremendous amount of customization and integration, uh, and th- that, those parts can also have security issues. Uh, and then they go play golf with their ERP salesperson and say, hey, I'm worried about security. You no, know, we've got that covered, right? So that's a, a conversation I've had far too many times where, uh, you know, going into an organization, if they're like, well, use, we use, uh, you know, this ERP system and that handles all, all of our security. It's like, well, this meeting's not going to go well because I'm going to have to overcome a perception uh, or you know misperception I would say that uh, that that ERP security is like number one already totally baked in and number two is the entirety of the security world uh, so that's one of the challenges that we see especially in a lot of firms in the energy space is that you know their ERP system and the associated customizations is viewed as you know managing security and you know to Kent's point you know just because of that customization uh, it's, it's it's often hard to upgrade these on a on, on a cycle as fast as you'd like. Uh, you know, but there's also additional kinds of software we, we see that are specific to the energy sector. You know, the uh, ETRMs, the energy trading risk management systems are one. Um, you know, we also see, again, a lot of the you know, standard line of business systems, HR contract tracking uh, and whatnot, uh, plus some really cool and interesting specialized stuff for oil and gas, you know, oil well modeling, real-time telemetry tracking, and, and, and moving over into these uh, OT or operational technologies. And a challenge, especially with those, you know, with kind of the applications that I see as being cool, you know, there's a lot of IP, intellectual property uh, built up in there. And there's also, you know, we've seen in a lot of cases a, a, a culture or a desire for secrecy around that IP. You know, they don't want to share with security. They don't want to share with outside firms, uh, you know, these these critical algorithms, these data sets that they've collected, which which I understand. But that uh, that desire for secrecy often also leads to bad security outcomes. Um, and so, again, just kind of across these different types of system, we see a lot of valuable data moving through the systems. Um, and that's exposed in the organizations to a, a, a variety of risks to the you know, confidentiality, integrity, and availability uh, of those systems. Kind of part and parcel with that is the fact that organizations are running more than just one software solution at once, meaning they have a wide application portfolio that uh, often need to speak with each other. They need to have integrations with uh, the wide gamut of software solutions. And this, if poorly managed, can create domino effects for potential risks. So how does an organization's attack surface, their application portfolio, often influence potential risks? And what are some strategies to work with that? Portfolio and attack surface management are key practices. And it is across the board, not, not peculiar to energy firms, but across the board is something that organizations are really, really bad or tend to be really, really bad at. And the the, the reason is bad is you can't defend attack surface that you don't know about, right? And you're, and you're probably not monitoring attack surface that you don't know about. So you can't detect those potential intrusions or attacks and, and respond to those appropriately. And in the energy sector, you know, this can be an even greater problem because you see this split between, uh, you know, OT systems and IT systems, right? If those report up through different chains, then you don't have one software portfolio you're trying to manage. You actually have two and they report up through different groups with different practices, you know, one of the reasons why you know, convergence to those is, is, is interesting and has uh, a lot of potential benefits. Also, in the energy space, you see a lot of M&A activity. Uh, that makes this problem extra hard when you're uh, acquiring portfolios and divesting yourself of portfolios. And also with the boom bust cycles um, in the energy space, you see rounds of layoff. You know, institutional memory can erode. Um, you know, that's something where I've I've some of the scariest meetings I've been in. Uh, you know, not necessarily energy specific, but have been ones where 
new attack surface gets get discovered by executives from the firm, you know, they're from the same firm where they're like, no, we turned this application off. It's like, no, we didn't. We left it on for this customer, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, it, according to this contract that we have. And so as you lose that institutional memory, uh, you know, you lose in some ways the ability to reconstitute that full portfolio. You know, so what can firms do? Again, you need to be able to enumerate, you know, where are our data centers? Uh, you know, what are our different vendors? Where are our cloud environments? You know, and there's also, you know, there's some startups in this space that are uh, that are, they're helping with this attack surface identification uh, stuff as well. I would piggyback on what Dan was saying, in in particular around the migration to cloud and the convergence of IT and OT. These themes present an opportunity for organizations to take control of their application portfolio and to do some consolidation to reduce that uh, attack surface, to reduce the size of that portfolio, the number of applications that are involved as they combine from the IT, the OT side of the house, and as they move applications from their legacy on-premise or uh, older software as a service vendors into a more consolidated cloud portfolio, it lets you shrink that attack surface. That presents some different risks, but it is a great opportunity as companies are making these types of investments to take that opportunity to consolidate and reduce that attack surface. I want to quickly bring up software supply chains as well. Uh, This is another aspect of the application space that's often ripe for targeting. Can you give us some insights as to why? What is it about software supply chains that create more vulnerabilities? And how do hacks to those systems impact energy firms? Some firms develop software, but all firms purchase and consume and use software. And, And those are you know, just kind of broadly looking the two sides of your software risk exposure, uh, you know, what did I build uh, and deploy myself? And what did I buy from someone else? Your exposed risk from both of the way that you deal with that risk is going to be different because you're sitting from a different vantage point, you have a different uh, control. You know, if, if looking at especially some of the kind of niche players in the energy space that are selling packages that do specific things, you know, if, if I'm a, a bad guy and looking, you know, that gives me targeted leverage, right? I can say, well, I want firms that are doing a certain thing. I want a certain type of access. Let's go upstream from them, mess with the providers of their software. And then that gets me into, uh, you know, it gets me into that organization with some level of access. And also looking at a lot of the, the vendors of these specialized packages, they're, you know, small or medium sized organizations. You know, they probably historically haven't had a lot of focus on security. You know, have they had the budget for security? Has this been uh, a focus area for them? Probably not, you know, because their customers aren't asking for it. If your customers aren't asking for it, like, why would you go and do it? You know, it's uh, I'd, I'd love to make the argument of, you know, it's uh, the good hygiene argument, right? To say like, you know, hey, you should take a shower every day. Like I would agree. I think everybody on this call would probably agree. Uh, but uh, you know, especially in a work from home environment, nobody's going to make you take a shower every day, especially if you've got other stuff to do. And so that's a challenge is, you know, in, in a lot of industries and especially in the energy space, uh, we haven't seen a lot of demand from consumers of software saying, you know, thou shalt do this, you know, but again, I think that's short sighted. Uh, and so I think all firms need to be looking at the software uh, that they're consuming. And especially when they have these niche vendors or vendors that may not be as sophisticated from a security program standpoint, they need to ask some questions. You know, hey, what does your security program look like? Uh, and this is also an area where it, it uh, there's a lot of benefit in doing a show exercise versus a tell exercise. It's one thing to ask the question, "What are you doing?" Uh, it's another thing to say, "Oh, you're doing uh, you know security scanning with this tool. Cool. Can we see a redacted report of the last scan that you ran? <laughs> uh, and let's see if the data is in line with where you said uh, you were going to do that." You know, if you ask somebody, you know, what do you, what do you do for security for your software? If they come back and say, well, we use SSL certificates or TLS, that's a really bad answer. Not just because it's you know, it's insufficient, uh, you know, but because it also re- reveals a mindset that shows uh, a, a misunderstanding or that they're framing the problem wrong. Um, you know, especially when we look at application security. Uh, I can't remember if it was uh, Gary McGraw or Michael Howard, two real prominent folks in the space, but they talk about you know you need secure features, not just security features, right? Encrypting traffic. Traffic is a security feature, which is great. Making sure that someone can't, you know, look at uh, you know, records they don't have authorization for—that's a secure feature. You know, you need to understand like what is this team doing when they're building their software? Are they doing it in a way that's going to be resilient? Um, you know, so what do you want to look for when you're talking to these firms? You know, you want to look for something that's more programmatic. You know, not you know we use this tool or you know we use this p- particular security feature. 
but you want to understand like you know, what's your program's mandate? You know, do you provide training for your developers? Uh, you know, what do you do for secure design? Are you doing threat modeling? What is your testing cadence and what does that look like? What sort of operations support do you provide? Um, so that's something that, uh, you know, again, at different levels of, of sophistication, but I think it's something that firms in the energy sector need to be asking of their vendors because when that starts to be tied to the sales cycle, when it starts to be tied to upgrades and expansions, that's when those vendors are going to take note and take action. And just kind of broadly looking at if I'm building software or if I'm purchasing software, if I want to make the software I build more secure, uh, I mean, there's challenges with that. I've got to get my dev teams to change their behaviors. Uh, if I want to change the security of the software that I'm purchasing, uh, that's a little bit easier in certain cases, or it's uh, you know, in, in certain aspects easier because you can change your uh, you, know, you change the purchasing contract uh, and push that burden off on someone else. And so, you know, a movement that we've seen you know, broadly in the industry, especially in financial, um, but you know, starting to spill it to other places, is that environment where everyone's asking their vendors, what are you doing for security? Um, and, and in that way, all the vendors then have to pay attention to security because they're all trying to sell uh, you know, into those same uh, environments. Yeah, I do think the energy industry broadly has been a little bit behind some other sectors. Dan mentioned specifically the, the financial services area. I think they've been a leader in some ways here. But I have seen a bright spot start to emerge in the last call it three years or so, in the power vertical specifically. Assurance of the technology supply chain has really become a priority for the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, or NERC, uh, for the last several years. And they've introduced new SIP standards. They've revised them, and they've established a collaborative program across different stakeholders in the industry, whether it's software vendors, the power companies themselves, etc., to al- enable more communication and collaboration and driving standards for the security and the assurance of the software supply chain. And one of the areas of focus is specifically the supply chain risks uh, from what would have historically been viewed as low impact assets. So uh, you know, we talk about the application portfolio management consideration, early standards, early work in the space focused on the big tools, the obvious tools, the OT tools that touch the assets. But there's been a recognition and a little bit of an awakening that any soft spot is something that a, a threat actor will exploit and use that for leverage to attack their ultimate target. And they're playing chess, not checkers. So I, I think that's been a good recognition. And so there's definitely been some promising pockets of progress. Right now, I think power within the oil and gas, and the energy industry is leading the way to a certain extent. Now, let's take a quick break and look out to other industries for some insight as we try to take all of this context and turn it into some actionable strategies. Are there other industries that are mitigating cybersecurity threats in a particularly exciting way, in a very effective way? And can we be learning from that? What's working for them and why is it applicable to energy? So broadly, you can look at this through the lens of the so-called CIA triad or confidentiality, integrity, and availability. If you really want to see some great lessons, uh, you can look at the banking and financial services industry because they really lead the way, especially when it comes to confidentiality. They're really good at the confidentiality, protecting the confidentiality of regulated data. I say really good, relatively good (laughs) uh, in a world that continues to see serious data breaches. Um, But but they're they're at the forefront of this because they lose money. Uh, and when you lose money, that's a pretty immediate impact. Uh, it happens relatively frequently, and that causes pain. And feeling that pain causes changes in behavior. And so, uh, I think again, looking from a confidentiality standpoint, looking at some of the things that folks do in the banking and financial services industry are helpful. You know, but you can't look only through that uh, lens. Uh, Josh Corman, who's the at DHS of CISA these days, another you know app security person really advise also looking at or understanding uh, you know, what the healthcare and especially the medical device industry should be doing. Uh, and I say should be because I don't, I don't think they're as nearly as good as they need to be yet. But if you look at a number of the apps that are being built uh, in the energy sp- sector, especially the ones that are uh, you know, OT oriented, the ones that are dealing with real-time data, and especially the ones that have the ability to impact the kinetic world, right? Where you're making some sort of a physical real world decision based on the data coming out of the system or the data that's flowing through the system or the integrity of the code 
from a uh, integrity and availability standpoint, like all of a sudden those two aspects of security become potentially far more important because that is impacting, again, your ability to generate power. Uh, you know, it has the ability to impact uh, your know, life and safety. Uh, and so I think some of the literature around, uh, you know, th those devices would be valuable to look at for, the, for systems that are uh, particularly exposed uh, with that ability to impact the kinetic world. I want to wrap our conversation by breaking down all of these insights and turning them into strategies now. Uh, let's really hone in on how we can morph all of this into actionable, proactive, and also reactive mitigation strategies for energy firms. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to pose several security and assurance activities that energy companies can take to mitigate cyber risks. And if you could break down how these processes are being integrated into day-to-day -day practices, when they're most useful and why. So let's start with threat modeling. You've brought this one up a little bit before. Uh, you know, to what degree do threats need to be modeled uh, and how much preparation needs to go into that? How does that impact mitigation strategies? The threat modeling is a little bit of a misnomer. Uh, you know, threat typically refers to an outside actor that's trying to do something bad. When we talk about threat modeling in the industry, though, that's more referring to like system architecture analysis, uh, just to be somewhat pedantic for, for, for a moment. <laughs> um, but, but threat modeling is great because it provides an overview of what are the assets in the system and how do they communicate with one another. This is a really valuable practice across the board, especially early on in the design lifecycle. Uh, because it's going to provide your system engineers and your developer with an understanding. Here's all the parts. Here's how they fit together. And here are where particular things can go wrong with the security in this architecture. Uh, it's a great learning tool, and it's great. It's a great way to kind of take an outside or an inside out view of security, and to start from the, the outset, uh, thinking about security in the system and, and the the deliverable that comes out of that, or the you know is is a lot more durable, you know, versus you know as we'll talk about, you know, a, a a scan or a test or something like that. You know, it's great because it shows here's the architecture of the system. It's probably going to move slower, uh, and it's something that the developers can use. It's something that the architects can use. It's something that system testers can use. So really really valuable practice just to drive an understanding of like, here's how all of this fits together and here's where things can go wrong. You know, we, uh, we recently were working on a, a, a large energy firm was moving a lot of their development processes out into the cloud and we helped them threat model that to understand, well, here's how code is going to flow through these different tools to create an ultimate deliverable. And that gave them an understanding again of here's what we need to be careful of as we move our development practice into this cloud environment. And that also has a side benefit from a you know software supply chain standpoint. It, you know, it, it, that lets them represent out and say, you know, here's how we've, you know, here's what our build process looks like. And we've, here's the, you know, kind of adversarial look that we've taken at this. So you can have a certain level of confidence that what we're building uh, is, is, is behaving the way that we think it does. Next strategy is implementing some type of vulnerability scan uh, that is conducted frequently and in a proactive and reactive way. Can you break down how to put together the, uh, most productive and efficient type of vulnerability scan? How often do these uh, scans need to happen? And when done correctly, how can this help mitigate risk? Right. And so, you know, and when I think of vulnerability scanning, I'm thinking a lot of like the network vulnerability scanning, identifying are there servers that need to be patched or there servers that need, are, are misconfigured, you know, and you can, you can extend that out to, you know, now they provide you with, uh, or there's certain cloud environment scanners and whatnot. And so, again, these are the types of things where you can do them frequently. Once you, once you have the process figured out, you can really increase the frequency, tie that to, you know, how often your environment changes as well as, you know, for the common packages you're using, how often. Uh, new vulnerabilities are being identified. Th the most important thing, though, with vulnerability scanning, you know, that's getting you know, scanning for vulnerabilities is pretty easy. The technology is pretty well established. The challenge is how do you respond or what do you do with the results, right? <laughs> uh, finding vulnerabilities I've found is pretty easy uh, just as a person in the security space and, you know, working with our pen test teams and our uh, you know, code review teams and things like that. Finding the vulnerabilities isn't the challenge. It's how do you select the vulnerabilities that you're going to address uh, and work those through the remediation cycle. You know, fortunately, you know, on the vulnerability or network scanning side, typically the uh, the fixes for those are things that are uh, you know, again, uh, you know, turn off this service that shouldn't be exposed, uh, upgrade this, change the configuration, uh, you know, patching and things of that nature. 
Um, and so those are more like versus the apps that sit on top of them. These are uh, you know, somewhat easier practices, although, you know, just t- saying patch everything is not useful advice. And I recognize that. But, uh, you know, that's the important thing is to understand when we find things, how are we going to work these through the process? And again, in cloud environments, hopefully organizations are now treating their servers as uh, cattle as opposed to pets. I can't remember who I stole that from, but that was a a very important change where you're saying, okay, hey, we we don't like the configuration of this server. Well, let's change the uh, uh, you know, let's change the uh, infrastructure as code so that we address that and just redeploy the system that can, that can sit on top of that. There's also a good amount of static and dynamic code analysis that can help mitigate risk for energy firms. Can you break down that analysis for us? Uh, what does it look like at scale? Any challenges in maneuvering those kinds of uh, assurance activities and what are the benefits when done well? Uh, definitely. And so uh, just uh, kind of taking a step back, the you know, static analysis is uh, looking for security vulnerabilities in your code at rest. So either the application source code or an application binary running that through some sort of, uh, you know, building a model based on that, running through different types of analysis and identifying patterns that look, uh, you know, that look like they would be associated with vulnerabilities. Uh, Dynamic analysis is the idea of taking a running application and sending requests to that application, watching the behavior and its response in order to identify, well, here's a request and response pattern uh, that are, uh, you know, that that are worrying for whatever reason. There's also now this concept of uh, interactive application security testing where you have an agent that runs on the system, you exercise the system and it kind of combines the the best of, of both. Uh, but the idea here is looking at the application code uh, that you've written and how it behaves with all the you know, libraries and, and whatnot. Like a challenge here is just dealing with false positives. Any automated technology is going to have false positives. Um, and so as you say, when you look to roll this out at scale, you know, if you're looking at a application, maybe it makes sense to turn the you know, to, to kind of turn the gain up where you're getting a lot of stuff so that you can sort through and really go deep. Um, you know, or if you're, uh, you know, if you're trying to scan at scale, uh, or if you're trying to scan very quickly and get actionable results, maybe you want to shrink that rule set down, uh, you know, again, and, and the really what we look at is this concept of coverage, um, you know, also to include manual code review and manual application testing, finding the types of vulnerabilities that those automated scanners can't find, you know, you want to understand for an application with this risk profile, Understanding that everybody has a limited budget for testing, just of of of, of people that they have to test in 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 house or outsourced, uh, you know, for technology and whatnot. Uh, you know, you want to tune that so that you're applying the appropriate level of introspection uh, at the appropriate interval, understanding that you have a portfolio of applications and a limited budget for that. And so that's a you know kind of an exercise folks need to go through to understand like which of these applications are the most serious. Great, they're the ones that are going to get the inspection and, and uh, the more inspection and more frequent inspection. Uh, and for other applications that pose less risk, uh, you know, they're going to be treated in a different way. And again, the kind of critical thing that is ignored in a lot of cases is what happens on the back end of this. How do you take the results of this testing, clear out false positives, and bundle those up and communicate those to the development teams? You know, as I said, with the vuln- scan- vulnerability scanning, you're typically going to server operations or cloud operations and saying, patch this, you know, bounce this machine and you know, put a one that looks slightly different up or something like that. A challenge with the results that come out of static and dynamic analysis is those typically require code changes. So you've got to get those over into Jira or whatever defect tracking system those folks are using, uh, hopefully bundled uh, you know, for best consumption. You've got to get those assigned to a sprint, assigned to a developer. The developer needs to fix them. You need to confirm the fix. And so the real challenge here is not necessarily running the scans because a lot there's a lot of automation associated with that. It's having the process on the back end so that you actually resolve the most serious vulnerabilities that are identified. Again, finding vulnerabilities is easy. Fixing vulnerabilities is valuable uh, because that's when you start to shrink uh, or reduce your risk exposure. All right, Kent. All right, Dan. I feel like we're approaching the end of our conversation here. So I want to ask a few wrap up conversations here uh, just to get a lay of the land on the horizon, what's ahead, and how we think that these challenges as well as potential strategies will continue to shape up. So looking ahead, are there some important or emerging trends and themes in application security that you think energy IT and risk leaders should be keeping an eye on? Anything that will particularly uh, shape up the landscape and create new opportunities or threats that you think are worth taking note of? I think there are a couple that are worth highlighting. You know, we already talked briefly about IT, OT convergence. 
So the next theme on my list would be that that steady progression from on-premises to hosted to SaaS and cloud. And this can shift some of the day-to-day burden from uh, an energy company's internal application security group to the cloud partner, but it brings a different set of risks. Since more companies are utilizing the big cloud vendors for key IT, OT solutions, the vendors themselves are becoming big, juicy targets for threat actors. And as we saw in the case of SolarWinds, that compromise, the impact of the breach can be far-reaching. So I think organizations need to take a look at that, think about how they manage that exposure. The second one that I highlight is the rise of citizen developers or people outside the formal IT department that are leveraging low-code or no-code platforms. They're becoming increasingly important creators of productivity and enhancing applications. They augment the tools that are purchased and built by the IT department, and there's a lot of value in that. It used to be that this was the domain of Excel spreadsheets and access databases, but the rise of these purpose-built cloud-based platforms is making it, in many ways, harder for the application security groups to keep tabs on and enforce standards in a world where a user can go out to a website, put in a credit card, and minutes later be off the races building things, uploading data, and building applications that are kind of outside the portfolio management that we talked about without going through necessarily the same vetting of uh, composition or supply chain and those sorts of things. So I think those are two things that I would keep a close eye on going forward, particularly in the energy space. And to maneuver those challenges and to actually prepare a strategy that is resilient to change, some resources are going to be needed. Uh, That could be internal, external, industry-wide. So to maneuver today's and tomorrow's challenges, what resources would you say are most useful for IT application and cybersecurity leaders in the energy industry today and why? And how can we uh, strategize around getting folks those resources, getting it in their hands? I'll start with a couple that are particularly impactful if you're very early in this process, if you're just getting started. And then maybe Dan can talk a little bit about where you go when you're further down, the, further up the maturity curve. Uh, if you're just getting up to speed, there are a few that I'd look at first. NIST, or the National Institute of Standards and Technology, has a cybersecurity framework that can be a great foundation to help you get organized, structure the work, align your people. And additionally, you know, e- even if you're not a power company, but you operate critical infrastructure, whether that's pipeline or similar, taking a look at the resources that are available from NERC may be worthwhile. The second one is the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency has some good material for training and exercises that can help you jumpstart or augment your efforts. Uh, In in fact, they just offered a webinar on uh, April 8th on the topic of cyber risk in the supply chain like we were just talking about. So I'd I'd take a look at their events calendar. It's a good page to to bookmark, keep an eye on. And I'd say looking at, from an application security standpoint, an excellent starting resource is the Open Web Application Security Project, or OWASP, uh, OWASP OWASP.org. That's a worldwide group of contributors working together. They uh, have published a number of documents uh, that are really useful for organizations, both getting started in looking at application risk, as well as more sophisticated organizations building out a program. Uh, They've contributed a number of freely available open source tools to the community that help with different aspects of running a program. And they also run local chapters as well as uh, international conferences, which hopefully soon we'll be able to attend once again. Uh, but really a fantastic organization. Everything, you know, you can take advantage of everything that organization does uh, for free, which is nice. Uh, you can also sponsor and support the organization as well if you want to get involved, you know, both from a monetary standpoint or also just from a contribution standpoint to share some of the lessons that you've learned helping, um, you know, working in your organization. From an application security standpoint, I'd really direct folks to take a look at OWASP. That's uh, OWASP.org. And on that note, I think that does it for our conversation today. So thank you so much to our two guests, Kent and Dan, for helping us maneuver this broad and granular look at cybersecurity threats and trends in the energy industry, who the actors are, what the threats are, the impacts on broader energy networks as well as businesses and professionals, and what are some actionable strategies we can implement today and tomorrow to prevent and hopefully mitigate the risk around these threats. So thank you again to our two guests, Kent Landrum, Managing Director at Opportune, and Dan Cornell, CTO of the Denim Group. Kent, if folks want to find out more about Opportune's place in this side of the industry and how you're working to mitigate uh, cybersecurity risk, how can they get in touch? How can they learn more? I would direct them to our website at opportune.com. 
Easy enough. And Dan Cornell, same question to you. If folks want to find out more about some of the software mitigation strategies the Denim Group is putting together and get in touch, how can they do so? Uh, sure, you can check out uh, www.denimgroup.com uh, for uh, all the resources that we publish. Uh, you can go to threadfix.it. That's our app vulnerability management platform and talks uh, about some more programmatic stuff. And then if you are really excited about my views on things or the what I've been doing from a workout standpoint, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Daniel Cornell. Fantastic. Dan, Kent, thanks to both of you. Looking forward to chatting again soon. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for listening to today's episode of E2B, Energy to Business, an opportune podcast. If you like what you heard and want to listen to more episodes, make sure you're heading to our website, opportune.com, and subscribing to E2B on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. I'm your host, Daniel Litwin, the voice of B2B, and we'll catch you next time.